It is August the 26th, 2023, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. Here we go with another episode. Just the two of us today. Hi, Adrian. Hello. I'm, uh, I'm, it's a different two, though, isn't it? Surely you and Jeremiah have been like, doing a lot, like just the two of you, while I was traveling. And now Mr. It's just me. M- Mr. Hollywood Director does have some Hollywood Director meetings or something along those lines. I don't know. <laughs> is he taking meetings, is he? Is he? That, that, that's what Hollywood <laughs> Directors do, isn't it? They take Probably. meetings. I've I never don't understood know. that. I've never understood that phrase. I mean, I've only picked it up off the telly and what have you. But this is the first like, time I'm hearing that phrase. Uh, oh, is it? Okay, me, so, me so being uh, a yeah, non-native, I, I don't yeah. take meetings. I begrudgingly attend meetings. <laughs> you know, it's like I really don't want to be at the most meetings that I have to do. So. And I and I usually reply with this meeting could have been an email. Yes, or, <laughs> or, or just completely ignored. Yeah. 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 Anyway, anyway, sorry. So Jeremiah isn't here this week. But, uh, no, he's he has he has very good reasons to not be here i think i think it was quite kind of sad to not be able to make it so anyway um this is an episode i i i was debating if we should move this to somewhere in the future because jeremiah might be really valuable uh talking about this oh okay um and i'm intrigued well it's about photography and what it has to do with memory okay so so the 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 question is, uh, photography as a memory enhancement tool, how I'm, do you use photography in that uh, context? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about more than remembering where you parked your car then. <laughs> well, that is one aspect, of course, um, since we've had the, uh, since, since we all had multiple cameras in our pockets. Um those are being used for mundane everyday things as in i typically if i'm in a parking structure i typically take a picture of the car trying to include the big three that says i'm on the third floor yeah, you know yeah. so i i can find my car again that's or or i'll take a picture of a price tag somewhere in a store and so on so that that is that is definitely a use of a camera as a memory enhancer of sorts now mm-hmm. um other concepts here and we, and we'll get to one very juicy one um the it's called the photo as a cue concept right how does viewing a photograph trigger related memories as in Ooh. as in i don't know how, the, uh, when i go through pictures of an event that i was at meeting with someone, an interesting vacation or something. Um, very often those photos bring back memories. And that is that is kind of kind of one of the effects that you want. I find it really, really amazing to go through uh, pictures and then remember things that I would probably have completely forgotten at this point. So they are in there somehow and then they come out. But research shows that um, reliance on photographs can actually lead to the opposite. Oh, interesting. There is an effect in science, um, in studies, that's called the photo-taking impairment effect. Can, can before, you, before you tell us, can I have a guess at what that sure, might be? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Because yeah, uh, is it linked to the whole thing about being present in the moment? And if you experience something through a viewfinder, uh, then you don't make such a strong actual memory of what was going on. Is it is it linked to that at all? Well, that's that's when when you read the abstract here. I've we have a link to this uh, whole paper. Um, it, let, let me read it. The, the photo-taking impairment effect is observed when fo- photographed information is less likely to be remembered than non-photographed information. Three experiments examined whether this effect persists when multiple photos are taken. So what they did is they pretty much um, had people take photos of things and later they checked if they remembered. And the ones oh, okay. who did not take the photos had better memory of things. So Interesting. It is. It, it, there is kind of, I think, a difference between or a discrepancy between what you think is happening and what is actually happening. Because I think photos help me remember things. Yeah, okay, interesting. So I, I have experienced in myself, you know, the, um, 
the, 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 the obvious one, and it's an often quoted you know, example, is is when you have the candles on somebody's birthday cake. Right? If you're the designated photographer, then you'll have less of a memory of the thing actually happening. Um, uh, and and I've, I think I've probably experienced that once or twice myself. But then... Then I've also experienced the other side of it. So um, a, a photo um, popped up on my phone the other day. I, I have, as I guess many people do, I have one of those um, widgets on, on my phone that pops up photos from my Photos app, right? Mm-hmm. So, okay. so you, you, you get things that cycle through. And it's just, yeah, it's nice to see things. One popped up the other day of my son and uh, as a toddler. And all you could see was this toddler, with happily with a big smile on his face, um, in what looked like a long silver tube um and it was exactly that's exactly what it was it was at a, a children's playground and there was a you know a, a metal sort of tunnel between two things that you oh, could see, crawl through right so so it was it, it, if you picture a, a toddler in a in a winter coat and hat crawling through a uh, what looks like to be a sort of you know stainless steel tube of some kind that that's what it was and i instantly knew where that was taken i couldn't have told yep. you the date but i instantly i was like ah okay that's oh, that place that we I'm used to go sure to i'm pretty sure you knew exactly where you were standing what the ground felt like and so on yeah yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I possibly would have got some of the, that wrong but um i could all i could possibly almost tell you without looking at the metadata what camera i used at the time mm. um and so that uh, that you know, uh, that definitely is a memory enhancement tool, right? The photo has has uh, uh, has caused me to remember stuff. But it caused you to remember your own situation, your own, um, like like how it felt like for you there, and yes. not yeah, necessarily yes, yeah, yeah, what yeah. was in the picture and what happened there. So uh, true, true. I don't know how big that effect is. I didn't read the entire paper, just the abstract. So um, yeah. I don't know. I don't remember what I had for lunch that day. So clearly, the effect has some edges somewhere. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but I, I it didn't I've, remind I've me of this, the whole day. I, I've had this effect where where I was exactly in that same situation. I see a photo, and the whole like part of that day comes back, mm. and how how I got there and what happened okay. afterwards and so on. So yeah, it, it's it's. I think this is just. I don't think I don't think we have anything to really learn from that, other than it's very interesting. I find it really intriguing to uh, think about these things. Uh, another thing in that context is the of the possibly the over reliance on photos, like mm. the the risk of letting photos become like the sole keepers of our memories or the sole key to our memories. Um, I, I I have this effect where. I was never really good at reading maps or orienting myself. Like you could, you could, you could drop me somewhere, and I was unable to find my way home. I, w- not quite as bad, but in that in that direction. And and uh, having digital maps with me all the time—that's a godsend for me. That is oh, wonderful. But but of course, that <clears throat> doesn't help me train my map reading muscle. It's, no. No, kind of, no, my orientation that's... it's not the map reading it's the orientation it's the feeling of which way to go i have a friend you can drop him anywhere and he'll find the train station and the church and whatever he'll find things and i have no idea how he does it but that's built in um me you can practice not though. so much you, you can pra- i mean that's I, the have thing. Some, I have some of that i I'm, I'm i don't know that i'm as good at that as your friend but you know especially around cities i i, I you know i will just find my way and yeah, in part, it's it's just um, f- for me. Uh, I think partly it's practice. In that, le- yeah, I'm, as we all know, my biggest local city is London, and whenever I go to London, I walk around. And if I if I have to work in a certain office multiple times, I try and take different routes to walk places. So you learn and you see and you experience more, and you can take more photos, of course. What happens in a new city if I if I put you to I don't know tall if buildings? If I, if I took you to Stuttgart. I don't know Stuttgart, but I've recently been to several new cities in Canada on my trip, um, and uh, quite. So you, you have a landmark map in your head, so. The, yeah, often in cities, yeah. it's it's the tallest buildings first, and it's like okay, so you know, and and I don't know, it's it's in part it's conscious. I mean, I like to try and 
figure out when I land in a new city which way is north, south, east, and west. And I yeah. say, okay, well, my hotel is is east of that tall building there, right? So if I come out and I can see that tall building, and you know, and the sun is you know is in one direction, I can sort of orient, you know. And, and see, then, that does not work all the time. I had this. I have years, many years ago, I had a business trip to Fort Collins in Colorado, and I huh? landed at Denver and and. Prior, someone told me, well, it's very easy. You just go on the I, I don't even know which one, I-25 or something, and head north. And the way you know it's north is because the Rocky Mountains will be on your, on your left. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. well, very simple. So I arrived at 10.30 p.m., and there were no Rocky Mountains because it was night. <laughs> <laughs> so that does not always work. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um <laughs> Here's another aspect of, of uh, the photographic um, memory, so to speak. Um, and it's about photos that can create a biased or a selective memory. As in, as in you have this, I mean, you just told me about your, your phone popping up pictures on the lock screen or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's making a choice and it does make that choice based on some, K on some AI inside of it, which will look for... I don't know, things that it has learned that you might think are significant, like your child and um, maybe a picture that's nicely framed and maybe a smile on it. And that, of course, has the potential to to change your memory or uh, influence your memory because do you know what i'm already at the age where things are used to be better than they are today right i can already do that grumble <laughs> right like that that's that's no problem i remember the olden days and they were much better than they are today is that the sort of thing you mean <laughs> i i had a, i had a participant on uh, on a photo tour a few years ago who who said i take pictures because when i go senile they'll help jog my memory Okay, fair that enough. was his reasoning for taking pictures. At least, I, I think a bit tongue in cheek, but um, yeah, I, mean, I think I, there are things that I, that I have photographs of that I would definitely not necessarily completely forgotten, but never think about. And sometimes those things that pop up on that widget on my phone are things that I haven't thought about for ten years or more. Right? Um, yeah. I mean, it can only go back so far i guess to the to to digital yeah in digitization although as as a as an extended family we do now have a lot of the archive of photographs digitized back through the 70s you know some uh, so, some th back through to the 1940s but that you know li literally a handful of photos from the 1940s um uh but the it's so some of it will trigger events from when i was a kid but mostly it's the last 20 years or so since a lot of us are they are they shared well. among the family uh yes actually. there's a, so, there's a so, new like ios has this new feature with a share shared album family so we album haven't done kind of that thing. yet but the other major uh photographer uh in our family is my dad and so I do have a copy of my dad's library. So my dad has been digitizing stuff from the, the 70s and 80s and 90s for, for, for years. He likes to do it in the winter when it's less nice outside. So um, so I do have copies of a lot of the old digital digitized stuff from my dad. And I share more stuff with him you know, backwards as well. So he's got stuff. So, so but not it's not shared in a cloud based technology enabled way just yet. <laughs> We do we do this uh, at least for ad hoc photos with the family. Like we have a family group, and my parents are in there, my sisters in there. Oh, we do that. Uh, yes, definitely. And, yeah, and, we do and, that, but not. Then in a, sometimes we share archive. photos of a, of a nice meal we had and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yes. In fact, I got some this morning from my mum. So my mum's choir is deputising. Uh, my mum sings in a chamber choir. And uh, they tend to tour in the summer around some of the cathedrals in the mm. UK um, as the cathedral choirs go on their holiday breaks. Um, and so this weekend, my mum is at Worcester Cathedral, which is in uh, in Middle England, I suppose you could say. Um, and uh, she's singing it. She sent some photographs this morning looking very nice as it was. Uh, yeah, nice and sunny there this morning. So, yeah, we got all of that. And that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so 
What what do we take away from this? <laughs> sorry, I'm wandering off topic a lot, aren't I? Sorry. Don't, don't, that, that is <laughs> me too. Me too. No, the, the question is what what are we taking away for the future of photography? Um, we live in an age of well, some might call it over documentation, where like uh, even the smallest price tag is getting a picture taken of it, um, or you will take twelve pictures or something instead of just one because it's virtually free. But then of course that will add some cost in terms of having to deal with it later on unless you completely rely on the ai to do it for you and then you get a curated version of what you what you remember yeah. there's so. definitely so so there's definitely a burden of it i mean having just traveled for a month on a major family trip you know and taken lots of photos every day um, or lots for me anyway um there was then oh i've got to deal with these now i've got to sort through them and i don't want to build up a massive great backlog so i'm going to do it and it you know so i was spending 10 15 minutes a day and this is where i think some of the consumer grade tech really helps uh because i know that a lot of the listeners you know for, for our show will be using you know proper professional tools and that's because they are so powerful and and give you so much to work with lightroom being the obvious example uh, but some of the consumer grade tools can really reduce the cognitive burden. And the, you know, g given that you know, what I was doing when I was on holiday is I was taking out the, the cards out of my camera and I was using a dongle to load them into my phone and just in the Apple Photos app on my phone. And it's even as simple as like you don't get a five star rating in iOS photos. You get a like right you get a heart. very very non-granular really it is, it is yeah. very but that but the thing is right it makes it want, easier doesn't yeah, it? yeah it does it reduces the cognitive burden it's like okay i've got three photos which do i prefer out of those three photos that very similar right i'll just like that one i don't need to grade one as a two but one and, as a three and yeah it and it, it's it, smart because it because it prevents you from falling into the analysis paralysis trap yeah, I don't have to choose what grade of likeness. I just have to think of those three that I took at the same scene or the same same shot, essentially. You know, which do I prefer? And if it's a portrait, it's like, okay, the one with a nicer smile. Or if it's something that is, you know, about, you know, crowds moving through a city, it's like, okay, which one is, which one impacts me the most favorable way or whatever. Or, or, and then you, and that's, and your, your little hearts uh, give, give the AI food to train on. So yeah, do you know, I'm pretty, do you know sure, I did I'm pretty the, sure it learns from you. I'm sure I, I would hope that it does. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would hope that it does. And of course, the other bit of the workflow there is creating the shared family holiday photo album. And it helps there as well, because what I do then is I once I've done my hearting, I then filter on. And so I'm just showing the favorites, uh, which is a thing you can do in Apple Photos. You can just show the ones that you favorited. And then I select all of those and I share them into the family album so that the shared family photo album only has one of everything and it doesn't get the out of focus ones and stuff like that. So, um, you yeah, so, know, so that what I'm imposing on on <laughs> my my wife and children is is not the, the rubbishy stuff where I was knocking about or missed stuff. This is very different from the from the back in the in the good old 80s slideshows evening. Um, yeah. My uncle used to do that, and oh, my, my dad still has all the kit. He still has. We, do you remember you used to have had, a you have a projector which you put the slide oh, carousel yeah. in. We had to sit and down a in a dark table. Room. Yeah. Did you have a that looked a bit like a step ladder? Oh but yes, yes, wasn't. yes, yes. It yes, was yes. A, it was a, it had a sort of triangular a frame like a step table, ladder. Yes. yes and yes, the, but yes. and the projector was maybe you know five feet up off the ground or something yes. like that, 150 centimeters off the ground. And um, and that would be the right height for the middle of the screen, which is the other end of the room, right? And the screen was you often a we had ones like many do. It's like a metal cylinder, and you pull in it, it um, yes. retracts in, it's sprung, and you pull it out and hook it, and how it has its legs and stuff like that. Yeah, my dad still got all of that stuff. Yeah, and then you and then you had no skip forward button. You had to live through it. My uncle was was so extreme in that that he spent. Like, yeah, he had a very advanced system that would sync up to a tape player, to a cassette player. So he would, he would he would design music around the slideshow and have Did he do titles. voiceovers as well? No, no titles in there. So title slides. Uh, oh, wow. That, okay. he, that he photographed of a, of a little rig that could, you could have magnetic letters. And so it was, it nice. was wild, wild. But it, yeah, they were more of a, 
more of a torture session than anything else. So, so the trick is is the is whether or not people curate and you know, edit down their collection. So, so my dad was a you're going to see every single shot kind of fella, right? All the slides went into the carousel. I yeah. and there was no editing process. And it was that, even that worse. The, the uh, it's yes. even worse after they invented handheld video cameras because he quite got into those, and it was like, "Here's my three-hour-long video of our trip to the supermarket." And it was like, "Great, oh. Dad, when, when are you going to edit it?" <laughs> you know, in, in, infamous thing in our family is the India movie because he went to an India vacation and oh, right. <laughs> he shot the entire thing in Super Eight. So Houses, yeah, it was tricky. And, to be fair, it is technically uh, and physically tricky to edit those kinds of things it's not oh like he, it, he had the he had the, the the little rails and cutter and mm -hmm. sticky tape and stuff you have to do and he had he had a magnet uh, track put on it after the fact so he could put sound on it and then mm -hmm. that was like a 15 minute segment of my my aunt Getting on an elephant, getting off an elephant, <laughs> being on an elephant, being on another elephant. Um, so yeah. Uh, anyway, anyway, memories. I th I think we live. We actually live in glorious days because a lot of that is not a a thing is forced on you, but you can choose which pictures to to dwell on, which to um, zoom into, which to skip, and possibly we we have a we have a, we have an interesting and nicer future in that respect yes definitely i certainly uh i certainly love the memories that pop up now and as the as the kit gets cleverer and and you know then then it's only gonna be more fun i think and we we just we just uh, i think invented a new segment for the episode called the past of photography <laughs> Well, no, I think this is, I think it's very relevant. We're talking about memory enhancement, oh, yes. right? You can't remember things that haven't happened. So, you know, you know even even look at it this way, you know, let's let, let, you know, level it up a level, right? Philosophically, doing a podcast about how photography enhances memory has caused us to share some stories about our families, which is awesome. <laughs> I'll just I sure hope my uncle doesn't listen to this. So, um <laughs> I, I think the most I got into back then was I was cropping slides by sticking on black tape and making the borders bigger. Oh, okay. Okay. No, I, I did, because I came to photography much later in life, I, yeah. that, that's not something I ever did really. So um, I had a few snapshot cameras, yeah, film cameras when I was a kid, but never really took any of it very seriously until I was a, a proper grown up. All right. So I, I guess the I guess the future of photography angle here is just be mindful of when and why you choose to capture a moment and don't overcrowd your 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 photo library and the, the photo libraries of others. Yes, especially probably the photo libraries of others. I think we need we need a, a set of uh, well uh, that's what Facebook's for, isn't it? So yeah, you know, I, I, I I opt out of all of that stuff so that I don't I don't suffer from seeing too many of other people's photos because. I'm just I'm just hoping that I'll never get on Monica's uh, photo block list with my pictures. <laughs> she got one of those, has she? I'm not sure. All right, <laughs> let's move on to our picks of the week. I have one. I have one, and it's a very like not photo and memory related whatsoever, but it's something I recently came across. So. Um, you know how if you're on a tour, on a trip, um, you've just been on one, you have to take care of like charging batteries and things. And, oh, yes. Uh, especially if you take like a proper camera, air quotes, and uh, you, then you need a ba the battery charger with you. And like it's very, 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 it gets very cumbersome unless you go to Small Rig. Not sponsored, but um, they have like a Canon camera batteries and others, I think, that... Like the, the the classical LPE6N battery that Canon uses, um, but they have a little a little thing where you can stick in a USB C cable. So you just plug it in. You just the plug it you into plug anything in into, your, into your laptop or into your like USB charger that you have with you anyway, and uh, and charge your battery that way. That's isn't that, isn't that's amazing? cool, isn't it? I, I, like, I like that. I, yeah. I like that a lot. I could see, you know, um, that that's a, a a nice, elegant solution. I I've invested over the last year or so. Um, the it, a lot of camera manufacturers' batteries now. When you buy the third party ones, you know, online, you can yeah. also buy 
the chargers that just plug into a USB-C. So I've tried to get to a point where I don't need to carry lots of power bricks and stuff like that because all of my battery chargers of different shapes and sizes will all run off a USB-C. But and you're I think still I'm carrying the charger. Pretty much there. Well, you, I mean, you can buy like a, a GAN charger that's just a plug these days. So yeah. It's just a, a big plug. Um, so I tend to, to use one of those and a USB-C cable and, and then... You know, I'm only carrying one plug or one cable for whatever variety of of charges that I have. Yeah, I'm I'm probably not going going to swap out my Canon batteries because they are very good and um, there's no reason to do that. But uh, for new ones, why not? I've seen I've seen that same uh, principle on AA batteries. You can get little AA batteries with a can little wow, USB C okay. plug from the side that you charge them with. So they have lithium ion thing in there, and they go. Uh, 1.5 volts, as they should, and okay. uh, I don't, I haven't tried them. I've just seen them, and um, they have their entire electronics and everything inside. Cool, mm. interesting, very interesting. All right, you brought us this East London photo stories. Yes, which is, um, I suppose, it is linked um, to the the theme for the day, which is you know, photography as, as memory. Um, this is uh, a, a link to uh, uh, Hoxton Mini Press, I think they're called, um, the which is a, a London-based uh, organisation that prints lots and lots of zines. Um, this particular mm. collection here, so they do lots of stuff, but I've just ch chosen this particular collection of zines because they relate to... Uh, uh, um, East, well, as it says in the title, it's uh, East London. Um, Hoxton is actually uh, an area in East London. Um, it's quite a trendy area these days. Um, and so uh, yeah, what you've got here, I, th I believe, uh, and of course, I haven't seen all of the zines, um, uh, but they're definitely on my list to to buy a couple and, and see what they look like. Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to give you a good collection. Of... They look really nicely bound and everything. I, I have heard that they are. I, as I say, I haven't seen them yet, so I need to. Um, I, I need to buy a couple. I think, um, and uh, I think it's um, it, it's a re It's going to be interesting to see just how you know uh, areas. Uh, yeah, areas are represented and how the different artists represent stuff. I think it's. Looking very I'm, nice. I'm hoping I'm going to see something that's familiar to me as well. I, a, a strange thing happened to me just a, a day or two ago. So there's one. Uh, there's a, a chap who I've mentioned here before. Actually, I'm sure I've used his book as a pick of the week before. Uh, a Spanish photographer called Adrian Filia, um, who has a YouTube channel, and he's doing his annual summer tour where he lives in his car for three months and tours somewhere. <laughs> and this year, he's decided to tour Scotland. And because I have uh, married into a Scottish family, I have quite a lot of experience of being in Scotland. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the photographs that he captures, that he makes in Scotland. Uh, and it it just brings, it, there's, there's an extra element of it that is when it's an area that you know. And OK, I don't know the whole of Scotland, like the back of my hand. It's a fairly big place, right? But but you know what it's like. And you know that in the landscapes make sense to me when I, I've seen them on his videos and one video so far since he arrived there. And oh, I'm really intrigued to see what he can do and what he will see that I don't see because I take it for granted or, or, or for whatever reason. So I'm looking forward to that very much. And I'm hoping I'd that... I, I just remember the, the thing, photo memory related, that I did um, when I did a photo tour to the same place uh, two years in a row. Oh. And what I was afraid of when I went there the second time was that I wouldn't find new things to photograph. And But but with the with a prior tour in mind, I ended up being like even more creative, um, knowing better where to go from which angle to take uh, something and in general the photos on the second one were like okay i i learned that yeah you don't squeeze out every last drop of a place within being there once you no, could probably definitely not. you could probably go there 10 times and find new things that's yeah, that yeah. Was okay. i mean even something that. as basic as like you the first time you go it's like well i wish i had that lens but i'd left it at home it's like oh, the next thing you go back you go, i can take the right lens this time <laughs> interestingly enough the second time i took uh, fewer lenses i was more like okay make, make this a bit more of a challenge and it totally paid off so 
Yeah. Cool. The cool. future of photography about memories. How about that? Mm. Yes. So I guess that brings us to the end of this episode. Hey, this, was, this was fun. I was um I, I was I was really happy to find that study and to to learn about this uh, photo taken impairment effect. It's, it's yeah, probably it's, worth a read. It's probably yeah, worth a read. Worth digging into. I shall do that. I'm looking at similar effects, photographic memory, the effects of volitional photo taking on memory for visual and auditory aspects of an experience. All right, there's a whole bunch of studies around that. I'm <laughs> I'm intrigued. Anyway, <laughs> this is. The future of photography will probably be gone for a few weeks because of things happening. But um, we'll be back soon. Until then, everyone, take care. And bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Mm-hmm.